This is a big one. Does God change his mind? Well, God doesn't change his mind just out of the blue and just wake up and say, oh, I think I'm not going to bless them anymore. I'm going to just destroy them. No, you change God's mind. That's how it happens. The people change God's mind. God had determined, number one, spoken it to Abraham to start with. They are going to bondage for 400 years, he told Abraham, the children of Israel. I will bring them out, establish them in their own land. Moses is carrying the people, three and a half million Jews, out from Egypt. They're a miserable bunch. God says to Moses, come up here. Moses has to climb an entire mountain to get to God. I don't know how many days it took him, but he climbed. Got to God and God said to him, get down. Because the people that you brought out of, of, of Egypt have done such and such and such, and now I'm going to kill them. Okay. He's changed his mind. Moses stands before him and says, okay, God, let me just explain something to you. Your enemy is going to say, he couldn't do it. Okay? And by the way, God, these are your people. And he and he give he, he, he intercedes and says to God, You cannot do this. And he actually said to Moses, Get out of my way. Because Moses had the promise. The point I'm trying to make is God at that point the people had caused him to change his mind. Although he didn't, Moses got him to stop. So there you already see within God's nature that he he has feelings. He's moved by faith. He's, 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 he doesn't like unbelief. He's, he, he, it puts him off. Now, I can go on and on and on. But people say, well, you prophesied that something would happen at a certain time and it didn't happen. Now, circumstances can change the situation. The reason I'm saying this is because God has to hasten or slow down because of time and space and because of people's decisions. God said to Joshua, he said, the Amalekites came and they attacked the poorest and the weakest of people as Israel was traveling through. Wasted their time because they attacked the stragglers, the people that were behind, the weak ones. Therefore, I will destroy the Amalekites. Write this down. Put it in the book of remembrance. I will totally annihilate and wipe out the Amalekites. I'm not going to do it today. But I'm going to wipe them out for doing what they did. By slowing the people down. Now remember God has said to Abraham 400 years. So God has to deal with people with their own world, the rebellion Attacks from the Amalekites, slowing the children of Israel down. Moses is on the mountain. Aaron's holding up his arm while he holds up his arm. They, they win when Moses' arm gets tied. His arms get tied. They start losing the battle. Did God plan that? No. So God has to adjust things because he put man in time and space and relies on man to obey him, to walk by faith, to do what he tells them to do. And when they don't, it adjusts the schedule. So the children of Israel... He had to hasten all of them. And, but he said, I'm not going to waste my time now, Joshua and Moses. By, by destroying the Amalekites, I'll do it one day. But write it down in the book of remembrance so I can remember. Many years later, hundreds of years later, God chooses a king. His name is Saul. Saul is a Benjamite. Lost his father's uh, stock. And he's trying to find it and he's, he's in trouble. His father's donkeys are lost. And he says, let's go to the prophet, prophet Samuel. Samuel will tell us what to do about our father's donkeys. He gets to Samuel, gives him an offering. Samuel says, I want you to have dinner with me tonight. I'm going to speak to you because you have been chosen as the king of Israel. Saul says, no, 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 no. I'm a Benjamite. Least family cannot accept this. Thank you very much. Now Samuel has to set him on a course to convince him. Tells him that he's going to go on the way. He's going to meet some people. going to give him bread, give him wine. He's going to go to the Holy Hill of God, see the Philistines there and everything. And he tells him that that's going to convince you to become the king. Now we see a little bit of time problem here. Now, that's, remember something. God has a schedule within time and space. 
People disobey. People decide, no, I'm not going to do it. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. There's a timeline here, boy. He says, no, Lord, sorry, I'm on a boat. I'm going the opposite way. What does God have to do now? Well, God should just kill him. Just kill him. No, God says, chases after him. There's tumultuous things that happen. There's a storm. Eventually, jo- John is thrown into the, the sea, this huge whale, whatever it was, swallows him, spits him. Think about this for a minute. All of this because Jonah just decided, I don't want to do this. Now, God has to adjust and work in so that it's in his schedule. Okay? So things change. They don't happen exactly at the time that he wants it to, even though he predicted that. Now, I'll speak to you in a minute about intentions. Let's get back to Saul. Saul, Samuel says to Saul, by the way, I've chosen you for one thing. You are going to destroy and utterly wipe out the Amalekites. Guess what? You're going to fulfill what I told Joshua. Guess what Saul does? Samuel tells him, God says, wipe out everything. Livestock, kings, children, wives, the whole lot for what they did to my people. Guess what happens? Everybody's expecting Saul to do it. Saul doesn't. He keeps the best of, of, of the Malachites. Spares them. Spares the king. Spares the livestock. Spares... And, and Sam, I guess, he says, what's going on? He said, well, I, I kept them and I, you know, and wanted to offer them to the Lord. And we have a problem. The Amalekites were not wiped out. There's a prophetic word I'm giving you today that did not come to pass. Because at the end of Saul's life, when he's in a battlefield, he's dying on the battlefield. David is waiting one side to hear what's happened. He's to, to Jonathan and Saul, his, lo- his beloved friend Jonathan, who he covenanted with. He was worried about King Saul. And a man comes to tell him, guess what? I did the job. Saul is dead. And David is so upset. He weeps and cries. And then he comes and washes his face says, okay, what happened? He said, I, I, I took his life because he wanted me to do. And he says to David, says to him, who are you? He says, I am an Amalekite. The very thing that Saul spared killed him and took his life. But the point I'm trying to make is this. God told Joshua, I'm going to wipe them, wipe them out. He didn't. He did not. Because of Saul's disobedience. So, the, And the thing that you need to understand is that God's intentions are not always his actions. Simply because of people, their will, their desires get in their way. I could tell you so much more about God changing his mind, but I'm going to prove it to you out of the Bible. And maybe it'll stop people calling people false prophets as quickly as they do. When you understand that God has to work in a timetable and the people that he's got to deal with for him to get it done. In 1 Samuel chapter chapter 2, it's about the, the priest Eli. And the priest Eli has a situation where He's lost control. He is the high priest that's been chosen since the time of Aaron. And God had given them a promise that their family would carry the priesthood forever. Listen to this. uh, Eli has sons who are out of control. Eli is overweight. I'm not saying that's wrong, but he has completely lost his desires, his inspiration to do what is right. To do his job as a priest. So a prophet comes to him and says... To Eli, who has been promised that he is family, Aaron's family, they would carry the priesthood forever, or, or until you know Christ comes. And this is what the prophet says to him: Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did, not cho- did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? This is this is Aaron and his sons. To offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me. And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why did you kick at my sacrifice and my offering? Please hear that. Why did you kick at my sacrifice and my offering? Which I have commanded in my dwelling place and honor your sons more than me. I have all teaching on how the sons kicked at the offering. They caused people to hate the offering. And make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel. Now, please look at this and don't ever say again, unless you know that 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 person that is a prophet is 
willfully trying to lead you away from the Lord God of Israel. That's what a false prophet is. Don't say it again. Unless you understand. Verse 30 of 1 Samuel chapter 2. This is what the prophet tells Samuel, uh, Eli. Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed. In other words, God says, I did say that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now, the Lord says, far be it from me, I've changed my mind. For those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. He says, now I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he will walk before me as my anointed forever. Guess what? It's there in your Bible if you believe it. The Bible says he changed his mind. Eli and his sons and his house changed God's mind. Now, I could go on and on and on. Remember something. When the Lord says, I'm going to do something, it is his intention. I'll finish with this. It was God's intention when he said to Isaiah, there was a king by the name of Hezekiah. And in those days, Hezekiah was sick and near to death. Isaiah the prophet gets a word from the Lord and goes to Hezekiah the king and says, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Hey, God just said that to the, one of the greatest prophets that ever existed, that prophesied virgin birth, Emmanuel and Jesus Christ. Tells a king, you will surely die and not live. So then Hezekiah turns his face towards the wall and prays to God and weeps. And God goes back to Isaiah when Isaiah is actually leaving and he's gone through the middle court and says, Return and tell Isaiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of your David, I've heard your prayers, I've seen your tears, I'll heal you on the third day, go to the house of the Lord and I'll add to your years 15 years. He changes his mind, good or bad. My point is this, I'm not saying that you to accommodate a false prophet. If, a, false, if a, a prophet tries to direct the people away from the Lord's, the laws of God, they are false prophets. There are some people that, that are false prophets that teach that you can sin, you can do what you like, there will be no problem with you, you can do whatever you feel like doing because grace will cover you. To me, that's people leading them away from the laws of God and, the, and, and they are false prophets. So it's not necessarily what is predicted that makes you a false prophet. God intends, let's say, Hannah's doing the questions today. Just say, Hannah, I said to her, Hannah, you know what? I've got a, a spare car. Uh, it's, I've got the keys. I'll give them to you in five days from now. I promise you, you can have the, the, the truck that I have. That's paid off. You don't have to pay a cent for it. I will give it to you. Hannah knows me. She knows my character. Based on her knowing me and understanding and, and um, that I'll do it, she says, yes. And she'll tell people without having the actual keys and the car, I have received a promise that I've got a car and I've actually got it. Five days comes, I call Hannah. I said to Hannah, listen, I leave a voice message. <laughs> I've got the keys, the car's clean, it's yours. Hannah is at home. She says, you know what, I'm so sick of this. I don't want to have anything to do. I don't want a car. She decides that she doesn't want the car. Was I wrong? No, my intentions were right, but I couldn't fulfill my intentions. Therefore, my action contradicted my intentions. Not because of me, because of her. So I intend to do something. God, when he prophesies, speaks, says something, it's his intention. He'll even say, it will come to pass, because he sees it as done. But if the people change their mind, God has to then make adjustments to the timing. Look, he promised the people of Israel they would be in their land. And they decided to come with ten spies and say, we don't believe we can take this land. Those ten spies decided, made a decision in God's heart. And God said, okay. And they wandered for another 45 years. Please understand that God has to work with you in order for that word to come to pass. And he can change his mind. Or at least you can.